Right, stand by. Roll sound. Speed. Roll camera. Speeding. Slate. Scene one, take one. Mark. And action. Hey everybody, how you doing? Bernie here with Bernie's Apple Box every Friday at 2 o'clock. And I have a very special guest today and a, a very good friend of the Apple Box Network, Mike Miller from Hybrid Studios. And Mike is someone who um, I met a couple years ago. And Mike has a very unique facility. You're the general manager here, correct? Correct. All right. And... Um, we did a little walkthrough for it, uh, and I think I'm just going to play that right now, let you see our walkthrough, let you see his facilities, and then we're going to come back and talk about it. So uh, with that, let's take it away. Hey, everybody. How you doing? Bernie here. And we are here with my guest on Bernie's Apple Box today, of course, Mike Miller. How you doing, Mike? Great. Thanks for having me. And uh, where are we? Tell me where we're at. Uh, right now, we're on the soundstage at Hybrid Studios, this is our cyclorama, uh, 20 by 30 by 20 foot dual cove cyclorama. Awesome, awesome. And this is so nice. I love the dual cove no, because yeah, I've great. been in so many situations where you need to get it. You don't want to lose an edge anywhere or anything. And this is so nice because you can work so many things. Sure. It's a great uh, medium size, medium large size option. And, and it's pre-lit. Yeah. So pre-lit can... with, uh, what, what is it, eight? We got image 87s? Right, eight Kino Image 87s above. Uh, they run down to a pretty simple DMX controller on the ground, so you have some functionality from the ground. Yeah, so you can take it from one tube up to eight, and, right. and you can control your each individual light. Though. Yeah, fairly easily without yeah. having to climb up there and, and do it by hand, right. which is yeah. pretty nice. Which I've done a billion times. Sure. Yeah, yeah. No, the DMX I'll go for every time. <laughs> Absolutely. But this is really, really awesome, and it is a premier soundstage, you know. Um, uh, and also, and, and we're going to tell why this is, they knew so to do this, but you have great acoustical uh, uh, materials in here. Tell me about that. Sure. It's not, you know, super hardcore soundproof, but um, you need to give some soundproofing options um, so we can do some more audio related things over here. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a lot of bands coming through and things like that, a lot of music videos, uh, sometimes with live percussion and things like that. So having some bass level soundproofing is absolutely Yeah, and crucial. it's very, very flat. Sure. It's very nice. It's very nice. Oh, this is really, really an awesome asset, and you know, I, this is my thing. Sure. So yeah, I love this. <laughs> let's let's uh, take a look at some more of the facilities cool. here. Come on this way, Sean. And uh, oh wow, so this is uh, wow. This looks like uh, wardrobe, and uh, I guess back there is makeup. Right? Yeah, makeup dressing room. Uh, okay. These are individual stalls. Yeah, um, so you can wrap these around and, right. and just take them this way for privacy there. And the exactly. actor can get changed or adjust whatever they need to do. And, of course, being in the stage, having a stage for the last few years myself, I know all about this. The first thing they go, do you have a steamer? Yep. Do you have a clothes rack? You know what right. I mean? And, and the answer has to be yes. It has to be. Yeah. You know, it's a small price to pay to it's something that every, every person right, needs right. in general. Right, No, no, absolutely, absolutely. They're going to ask you for the same things sure. over and over. Absolutely. Right, right. And what have, we, uh, what have we got here? Is this the, the, the green room? Yeah, this is our, our, our small green room called the purple room. The purple room because um, the walls are purple. I right, love yeah. purple as opposed to green. But, yeah, just a, a small space where you can keep talent um, or, you know, the customer nice. out of, you know. Kind Keep of them out of, the, out of your hair. Exactly. Just go ahead and say it, Mike. Okay. Just out of your hair. Give <laughs> them can, a place to sure. Give them a place to sit and something to watch. Exactly. They can still kind of see the production going on, but yeah, because you've got the windows, the which way. is really nice. I really like that because so many times people, they just want to know where the process is, and if they're here, they can see it. They understand. Oh, it's going to be another 15 minutes, maybe 20, or they're not even close or right. hey, I'm up next. Exactly. Yeah. You know, they can stay involved, but, but out of the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll tell you what, let's go see the crown jewel let's of do it. Hybrid Studios. I like it. All right, all right. And uh, so we're coming in now to your recording studio. Yeah, this your is... Your recording studio, right? Yes, the Studio A. And um, Studio A, wow, wow. Mind-blowing, mind-blowing. Let's 
Come over here. This is uh, this is a monster, dude. This is unbelievable. Yeah, this is like you said, kind of our crown jewel, uh, our cornerstone here at Hybrid Studios, at our, our recording studios at least. This is our SSL uh, Classic Analog Recording Console. It's a forty sixty four G plus. Do, yeah, a sixty four G plus. Yeah, forty sixty four G plus is the model number. Okay. So okay. The sixty four. Sixty four is. Go ahead. Yeah. So the sixty four uh, it stands for sixty four channels. Okay. Um, so basically, you have. You know, 64 ins and outs on this board. Yeah. Um, you know, each one of these things here, each one of these individual rows is a channel strip, basically repeated 64 times, and you can send out, you know, whatever you want to each That's individual channel. That's incredible. That's incredible. So your engineer is here. Your chief audio engineer would be here recording the session. Sure. And they program this as needed. Yes. Yeah, right? so, so we cater to a lot of producers and engineers who come through and use the spot. We also have our own house engineer that we put on, on a lot of sessions. Okay. Um, and yeah, they'll be sitting here. This is their workstation. They've got the computer there with Pro Tools. So they got kind of their mix of modern and old school. Okay. You got your old school analog console that everything yeah. runs through to get that nice old uh, crisp analog sound, right. and then it hits the computer for your your new style of recording. Adjusting, adjusting, right. and recording. So, and what are these back here? So, what, what is this? This is called outboard gear. Mm -hmm. um, these are basically your different sonic flavors that you can apply to anything. Uh, so, before you even assign it to a channel, you know, if you're gonna have tons of mics over there set up for a drum kit or for mm -hmm. guitars or whatever, you can send it through this gear here. These are all compressors and EQs. So this is where your producer really comes in to do, do his his or her work. Exactly. Yeah, they come in to adjust and, and make uh, make their sound happen. Absolutely. These are just the different flavors that you can apply wow. to your sound. So this is the stuff wow. that, that really appeals to producers and engineers. They love outboard gear. Um, that's how they can get really cool, unique sounds. You know, you know, this is just like knob overload it for is. me. You know what I mean? I look at that and I think, how would somebody know <laughs> what to do? Of course, it, it's relative. Sure. You learn it one step at a time, right? Exactly. And you learn your your art and your craft. You but, know. Yeah, but I'd have to agree. It is it is knob city. Yeah, it is knob city. No, that's. Uh, <laughs> I could just say, maybe this is going to be one of my Facebook posts too. I may just take a picture and go, what is this? Hey, go for it. You know what I mean? That, that'd be so. <laughs> And then I see you really have a nice uh, area back here for folks to sit. Yeah. And this is, uh, this is, I guess, uh, you know, produ or, I don't know, the managers or whatever would sit here. Sure. And, um, people involved in the project. Yeah, that's one of the cool parts of us being in Orange County is we're able to provide a little more space to people. Yeah. Um, your average control room, especially in, like, Los Angeles, is just not going to be this size. It's not going to have this kind of comfort. Right. And so... Um, you can bring in large, you know, crews to your session, have lots of people sitting in the back doing their thing. And yeah. because of the acoustic treatment and how dead it is in here, it really doesn't affect the production up at the front of the room. That's so amazing. it's a really cool option that we have That's here. That's amazing. And once you get your acoustical uh, solutions have been put in here. Yeah, this is, you know, even way more hardcore than the soundstage. I'd say these are, you know, three foot thick walls. Um, wow. Really, all this curtain, the padding on the walls is all um, functional equipment. To wow. keep this room super dead. That's awesome. And then what is this area where the musicians, what's that called? So that's our live room. That's the live room. Yes. So this is the control room. Correct. That's the live room. That's how you, you the two terms. Yeah, right? the control room is basically going to be where your production is during the recording. The live room is going to be where your band or your choir or whatever your, your subject is going to be in the live room. Okay, let's go in there and check it let's out. Check it out. Awesome. All right. Yeah, this is nice. Well, you know what? Aesthetically, you've just done just such a nice job out here. Well, stuff. thanks so much. What, these are little booths. I guess this is a VO booth, right? Yeah, so this is, this is isolation, uh, isolated space, um, yeah. a lot of vocals, uh, guitar cabs, things like that. Anything you want to keep isolated, that you, you put, put in, put in here. Space. Okay. Um, and that's the same over here for this one, this, right? The, yeah, same thing. This one's a little more oblong. Yeah. Um, use this one a little bit more for... Um, we put pianos in there, bass cabs, um, okay. put horns in there. You could put a drum kit if you wanted a okay. small sounding drum kit. Something um, you want to isolate and just get that sound alone. Exactly. Right? I and see. so, th yeah, these rooms are pretty integral. To and the then studio. you would mix it into the produced piece or the sure. piece that maybe you did in the live room and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, so, so. You, can, you can have everyone playing in the live room together but maybe you have a guitar amp over here by itself in the isolation room. So you get the best of both worlds. You get a cohesive oh. feeling of the band playing together, 
but the you know the guitar amp isn't bleeding into the drum microphones yeah, yeah. Um, because it's isolated in some uh, space. That's awesome. Let's let's check out sure. the, the live room here. Wow, wow, this is you know aesthetically, and I think this is so important too because I th I think about that a lot in in our industry. This is an aesthetically pleasing place, which is what you want for your creativity. Absolutely. You know, you don't want something that's making you feel down or anything like that. This is very creative. I like this. I mean, you've put a lot of, well, let's put it, you know, effort into thinking it out, but this is a lot of cost, too. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, but, you know, to us, it's, it's crucial. Yeah. Um, just like you said, giving someone a space where they're going to feel, you know, empowered to be creative is, is super important. We consider ourselves kind of a hospitality service. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we want to provide people a great room and we're gonna lock them in a room with no windows for 10 hours at a time. Yeah. It's gotta be there, a good There space. better be some place to feel right. good. With. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, and the lighting, I too, I really like. You, you've, uh, I mean, I just see that you have a little purple, you have some sure. additional, you have very nice lighting. In here. Well, thank you, yeah. I mean, the, the track lighting was crucial. I think the owners, um, beat their head up the wall a little bit, finding lighting that wouldn't affect, you know, sound at all or yes. wouldn't, wouldn't do anything like that. Well, that's got to yes, be a big consideration. Absolutely. 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 And so, so you have the grand piano over here. You have a organ here. They look like those two things just items stay right here. Yeah, right? those ones aren't so easy to move. No. Uh, they're especially here. the Hammond's uh, yeah. B3 is pretty, well, what pretty year, heavy. What year is that? Any idea? I, I think it's from the 70s. It's got to be from the 70s. Oh, really? Yeah, it's pretty sought after. Um, those are pretty awesome organs. Yeah, they probably had a sound that you don't get anymore. No, right? definitely not. Yeah, and those those Leslie speakers on the side, those those big brown boxes are speakers, so they're they're pretty cool. Unbelievable. And then we have um, back here, we have the the drum kit here, and I noticed notice that you have these baffles here, these these bafflers that you put in. Tell me, what do you do? How do you use those? Sure. So the the baffles, uh, I wouldn't say we use them all the time, but uh, when you're miking drums, especially, there can be mm -hmm. upwards of 20, you know, even 30 microphones on the drum kit. Wow. Um, you know, recording drums is basically recording the room that you're in. So if we need to put other people inside the room with the drums, uh, sometimes those baffles come in handy, at least partitioning off space a little bit, um, trying to give us a little bit of separation. If you're not going to put, you know, isolate everything into the individual sound booths mm -hmm. and things like that, those really help you give a little bit of division within the room so that everything remains clean and intact. That's, that's great. And, and these, uh, these amps back here, how do you use those? I mean, you're recording to that band. Tell me, tell me about that. How do you use these amps here? Sure. So we, we try to provide a, a pretty decent amp selection for people. Um, I like to say chocolate and vanilla options. Mm -hmm. So half the amps are, you know, really high end, high gain amps, meaning with distortion. Uh, and then some of them are headroom amps, which means they'll give you really nice clean sounds. In, in general, I, I feel like if a guitarist has something specific in between those two ranges that they want, that they're mm -hmm. going for, they'll, they'll tend to bring it themselves. Okay. Um, so we really just try to provide both ends of the spectrum. So this is something maybe the individual, uh, just like um, maybe in our world, the DP would have a, a set of lenses that he prefers. Sure. It did not use the house lenses because he's got those those tuned just like the he wants to. Absolutely. Yeah. But yeah. if they're trying to go for something unique within the song and they need a really good high, end, high you know, high gain option, yeah. we've got that. Yeah, um, that's so awesome. So it's nice to have those tools, but any sort of specific type of sound, because you could get, there's a million different sounds. Sure. You know, we, we, they would just bring that themselves, yeah. I would say. Yeah, and some of these look kind of old. How, how old are some sure. of these things? Um, so this this Fender Twins, is, I think it's 79. 79, uh, wow. A little bit older. Um, this is this is an Ampeg B15, a uh, vintage B15, cool bass amp. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of cool because the tubes are on the outside. Oh, um, awesome. It's called a flip top. And they're they tubes. Inside. Yes, they're the tubes. tubes are actually in here. Um, yeah, and not, when, not, not chips, not no. transistors. <laughs> they're tubes. Actual tubes. Incredible. Um, so you can store this thing, you can flip it and store it inside, and then when you're using it, you flip it out, which is kind of Amazing. Cool. Pretty unique for, for amps. And yeah. That, those, there's some vintage ones. Everything else, I think, is pretty much a reissue for a modern yeah. amp. Yeah, yeah. No, it's very, very cool. I know I was a... Uh, those amps were the only thing on stage, like when I saw the Beatles. They didn't even have a concert. That was back in 65, right. obviously, but I, I see the Marshall. I think that's what they used. That would be exactly yeah. what they used. Yeah. Um, that's incredible. That's incredible. 
Well, let's go on to check out the rest of the facility. Absolutely. Here. And your new tenant, too. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best part. That's it. That's it. Yeah, this is just beautiful. Just beautiful. Thank you, my friend. So this is, uh, we're coming out now into, you got parking back there. I sure. see plenty of parking. And we have like a kitchen area here, so they put their crafty up during exactly. the session and stuff. They can come out here and have a snack or whatever, got the fridge. Yeah, some good common areas, shared space. And this is another, uh, this is another studio right here. Yeah, that's our Studio B. It's our smaller option. Can we He's, peek in yeah, there? Yeah, you can peek in there. Yeah, He's come not on. In. Uh, so it's being it's in use right now, but this yeah. is basically our smaller budget option because we okay. cater to a lot of producers and engineers. Sure, uh, we needed to provide them a smaller option. Right, um, a lot of music production doesn't require that huge live room or those isolations. Right, fit. so so you've got a smaller selection too for a person that comes in. I've got part of a project I want to do. I just need a studio space to do some tweaking, whatever. Yeah, exactly, yeah. if they need to do tweaks or mixing, yeah, they can record vocals. We got this little vocal booth here. Oh, okay, so awesome. Th there's, you know, you can Let record vocals yeah. in this room. Um, somewhat limited what you can do here, but yeah. a, a lot of music production, you don't need but all look, the space. Exactly, just like no. video, everything's getting smaller, more compact exactly. and tight. Yeah, yeah, let's go check it out. That's uh, in this nice, just waiting area here for yeah. guests. Sure, a little remember. lounge. Yeah, yeah. Now, here's the one that I, uh, I'm excited about. Apple Box Studios moving into hybrid well, look studios. At this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome having you. So, uh, well, you know, I called, when we knew we had to move from our other facility, I called around and was making arrangements and stuff and talking to several people. I called Mike up and I told him what we wanted to do. And the first thing out of your mouth, which I'll, I'll thank you forever for, was, that sounds great. We'd love to have you. First thing out of his mouth. So I, uh, it, it was just so great. What we did is, is Mike took the boardroom, cleared it out, and uh, we put a green screen studio in there. And this is where we do all the shows for Apple Box Network, which you're watching right now, one of them, Bernie's Apple Box. So um, that was so, we are so grateful, Mike, to be uh, involved with you and involved with Hybrid Studios and the awesome work and the, the, the really attention to detail and the high-end production that you, you do. It's a real honor to be here. Oh, thank you. you. It's really an honor to have you guys. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, most of the people here are from a music background. Yeah. So infusing this place with more, you know, video professionals is something that we've definitely had in mind. Um, it's, good. it's awesome having you. Yeah, no, it, the same thing. And you know, that's one of the reasons that, and we'll talk about this during our interview too, is that uh, I wanted to be here is because the worlds always are married mm -hmm. in the final product. Absolutely. But they're so separate in the real world. Sure. You know what I mean? By finance, by, by, by workflow, and just, just a lot of different things that it's so, so great to be here. And uh, just thank you, buddy. Thank you, man. For showing us around. Absolutely. And now we'll go back to the interview. And we're back to the interview. So that was great for a for a consistently underlit color balance off <laughs> video. You saw everything just as it is. So, uh, uh, but thanks a lot, Mike. That of was course. that was really nice. And you know, I think people can understand now of why it is such a great thing. And I was so happy about you welcoming into your facility, Apple Box Network. And it really does make a nice addition to the other facilities that you have here, for sure. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, you know, you've got to forgive me, too, because I am a classic video guy. You know, I um, probably just focus on my thing, which is generally lighting, you know, and production. I mean, and running a business, of course, which we, we all have to do in some capacity. Um, but... With your facility here and, and putting this much money into it, having it in Orange County like that, that is such a great, great commitment to, to what you do. And primarily music. I mean, this studio, that studio, that audio studio is the, the, really the jewel of, sure. of, of your, your company here. And a guy like me who's been involved in production this long, you know, I know my little corner of the farm, mm -hmm. you know, but I don't know much about music. And I'm probably like a lot of people who have um, gone to this. 
you know a little bit about like how Napster started and that was very disruptive and then uh, uh, Apple came in and started doing the iPod and, and selling the tunes at I think 99 cents a piece for an individual song and it kind of broke up the old album mm -hmm. um, business. I, I understand that but it is so much more complex in music than it is in video or movies right now. And I think to a certain degree we're moving the same way. Sure. But, but you're an insider. You're somebody who's been involved in this, in this industry for a long time. Take us back just a little bit and tell us about the music industry and give us a, a short chronology of, of what's happened in the last 10 years. Yeah, I think you're spot on with the, the Napster thing. Um, it's it's multi-layered, obviously. Um, but going back to the time, you know, to a vinyl to, you know, eight track to cassette to CDs, there was always a physical medium that people were purchasing within music. And that just opened up budgets for for artists, for labels, uh, for all the you know the people that are investing in music. Um, nowadays, you know, it's it started with Napster. It's going to switch to streaming services, things like Spotify, Apple Music. Those are things that people pay ten dollars a month for, mm -hmm. uh, subscription based, and then they stream it all to like their phone or their computer. So they're streaming it in, you know, MP3, lower quality basically uh, than what you would get on a CD. And consumers, you know, don't really mind. I don't know how many consumers really even notice that they're getting a lesser quality product yeah. through their phone, through MP3. So that's one part of it. Um, and, and the other part of it is advances in home recording. So, you know, you can do a lot of stuff nowadays on your computer at home. Mm -hmm. uh, you're still not going to be able to do the quality level that you could do, you know, in a professional grade studio. But going back to the fact that people listen to MP3s on their phone, you know, the consumer for, to some degree, doesn't care as much about the inequality. Mm -hmm. They want mobility and ease of access. Um, so all of that in tandem together has kind of pulled, sucked a lot of money out of the recording industry. Yeah. Um, and then you have to go to bands, ha you know, have to come in and spend money to make music at a studio, potentially. Uh, but no one's going to be buying their physical medium. No one's going to be buying CDs for them. So it's not as much a put money back in your pocket sort of deal as it used to be for the artist. They so, still need it. They still yeah. need that product. You know, they go to a show and someone's like, I love your band. I want to show this to my friends or I want, you still need that product, but there's not as much of a direct return on it anymore right. as there used to be. So that's tough for everyone all around. I mean, you're still not going to be able to, and th there's always going to be that high level echelon of people that want the best quality product. But I think right now, it, music in general, music production is kind of an interesting place. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of it's shifting towards video for that reason. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of kids nowadays listen to their music on YouTube. It's because, right. as opposed to even if you don't have $10 a month to spend on Spotify, you're going to watch, you're going to listen to your music for free on YouTube. And you know what? You can get a, a big amount of entertainment on any of the free channels or any free, you know, like YouTube or anything Absolutely. else out there. You know, and I just thought of this when you were talking, going back chronologically, it was, it was almost to the 80s where MTV was maybe the first warning shot yeah. that the industry had there. Because I remember being, when it came out, and I, I can't remember, early 80s sometime, but I thought, man, this is the coolest thing I've ever sure. seen. You know, I don't care if I've seen the video five or six times. Right. I listen to the song that many times on the radio. Yeah. That's That doesn't bother me. So uh, that is, and as you were talking too, there were so many analogies I could kind of line up with... Uh, uh, our, our world, the video production mm -hmm. world, or or media. I, I don't even like to say video anymore. You know, there, right. there's just some words. I, I know I tell, tell people I work in film and video, but that's not accurate. I really <laughs> don't work in any of these. I, I'm digital media. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? It's zeros and ones. Right. You know? Um, but the analogy there, and especially the money, mm -hmm. especially the money applications of, like, what you would have spent and what you, you spend now... I remember yesterday we were talking and I, I made an analogy to you that it was um, the people who are real true audiophiles, you know, they will only play vinyl. They right. will only buy the, the highest graded system mm -hmm. that is um, uh, to, to, to play their records on. You know what I mean? The right. best speakers, the best needle, everything. You know, those people that are like that with visual 
you know, for us, like they want to see it in 8K, they want to have a pure picture, they want to have it color graded perfectly. All of those people are already in our industry. Right. You know, <laughs> there's nobody buying. They're all producing. It, no, you're you know? absolutely right. So, but but the general public is is for the better part just like with audio. They are not out there demanding. It. Right. They are not demanding the highest level. Really, what they want is they don't care if it's CD quality or 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 not. They want their song playing to them when the song they select while they're driving down the freeway. It's all about convenience. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. that's taken a massive shift. And convenience is great, but um, you know that does have its ill effects. It's a two-sided coin for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you're absolutely right. The you know I care about sound quality. I want you know I like to have the best sounding stuff. But I guess that's why I work at a recording studio. Yeah. The the so you're uh, exactly you're spot on. Yeah, yeah. No, I I think is I don't know what the what the the answer is, but but we're, we're both have a front row seat on it. Sure. I think it's just it's an interesting. Point. Uh, it's up to people like us in this industry to pivot and find out where yeah. the next place is to go. I mean, that's that's the way I've chosen to look at it. Yeah, an optimistic. I think you're is, right. You I know, think you're right. It's there's got to be something. People are never, not going to get sick of music, right? Or you know, sick of you know media in general. Um, oh, if anything, it's only growing sure. exponentially, and it will continue via via our, our pathways now, mm -hmm. our distribution systems through social media, online, all of that. It's it's only going to get better. Absolutely. It's probably more democratized, mm -hmm. too. Actually, you may not get as big as, as people did in the past as far as popularity and stuff, but you can produce your own content, too. It's true. Which is huge. Yeah, you know? and even from, from our end, you know, while a lot of the money has been sucked out, the, the ease of you know, creating music has gone up like exponentially with, with computers. You know, I talked a little bit about home recording, but we use a lot of those techniques that people use at home here as well. We can make music now much faster mm. than we used to be able to make. So it, it's a two-sided coin for us yeah. too. At least, you know, 20, 30 years ago, you had to cut to tape. You had to do all sorts of stuff that oh, would really drag yeah. out a session. Now everything's digitalized. It does make it easier on end. Can um, you give me an analogy but how long it took before, say, let's say 10, 10 years ago, because I think 10 years it was pretty much... Yeah, I think, um, I'd say 15 years 15, or okay. so. It's yeah. really been a shift to home recording. Um, like say, to do, to do a song here in the old way as oh, versus yeah. the new way, what is the time difference I there? mean, a lot of that depends on the band and your, the, the quality of the, the production. The creative, yeah. Yeah, but I'd say you know, several more days at least. Per, okay. You know. If it took one now, it right. would have been three back right. then. Right. Easily. Oh, that's major. Yeah. That's major. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's the word Pro Tools and being able to do things in your computer easily and and, and uh, efficiently has really sped up the recording process. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That's that's the analogy is our editing. Yeah. Almost. You Absolutely. Know, it's, yeah, it's really thing. democratized and and gone out there for good and bad. For good and bad. But the one thing that I think we both know is you're not going to put the um, toothpaste back in the tube. No, definitely not. It's not, not going back to the way it was. Right. You know, I am. Um, I wonder about things. You know, one thing, and and you'll understand my age with this analogy. You know, one of the things that I I go back and and I think about the Beatles. You know, because I was coming of age then. I was like 13 when they when they hit big in the U.S. and and I look at them, and as an adult, I look back and I study them, and it was, it was a series of improbable places, people, and happenings that made them number one in the world. Absolutely. You know, it was, uh, it was first of all, they were not, <laughs> they were from Liverpool. Mm -hmm. You can't get too much farther out <laughs> of the entertainment mainstream than I think Liverpool, England. That's true. So, you know, they, they cut their chops in Hamburg, Germany, which... Mm -hmm. Once again, that's not exactly a media center. Sure. You know, they came back and went back to Liverpool, and then their manager was not a music manager, but a uh, record store owner, because he was selling. You know, uh, people kept asking him for Beatles records. Sure. And their producer was a producer of classical music and comedy <laughs> albums. Right. Yeah. And that all came together to make the biggest band that the world has ever known up to this point. Absolutely. You know, the same thing is true now, but it probably won't happen in a studio like this, right? Right. I mean, 
you know, I talk to bands and artists all the time, and they ask me what's the best way to go about this or that or getting my music heard. There's, you know, so much luck involved, I yeah. guess, is, luck especially is, in music. Luck is not to be underrated. Not, not at all. The things that people can control uh, that I see, in, you know, band, not a lot of bands and artists doing is their work ethic and actually mm. going out there and promoting and treating it like a full-time job. Boy. Um, you know, and really going for it. That's the one thing they can control. The more you make yourself known, the more you record music and put it out there, the more shows you play, that's the most you can do to control your destiny. You gotta connect with good people, you have to be friendly and make friends with bands, but the work ethic has to be there. A lot of artists, I think, wait around to be discovered. Yeah, and or, or, think, or get creative. Right. They're waiting for their creative strike. Exactly, you know? and the, the guys that I see have, have success are very driven. Or yes. I shouldn't say guys, the artists and bands are very driven and believe in their product a lot and go for it and are down to invest in their product Yeah, because um, they believe in themselves. You know, it's hard, like I said earlier, for, to get an artist to wrap their head around, I'm going to invest a lot of money in making this album and no one's going to buy it. And I say, yes, you should give it away for free. Give it away. That's a hard concept for bands that don't have a lot of money to begin with. Right. Um, whereas, at least back in the old days, there was a little back-end incentive. Yeah. Um, but that's what you have to do if you want to, to, to get that luck to have the luck find you, you have to put yourself out all over the place. Well, I, I, I'll just tell you, I'll just tell you this. I hope everybody out there, and if, if you get a chance, once this goes back to recording it's off of live, go back to this, listen to what this man just said, because it is the essence of everybody's success when you're working like that. Mm -hmm. You know, anybody, I, I can tell you the same analogy. People in our business, you know, the ones that are successful are dogged. Mm -hmm. They don't give up. They keep going no matter what. I know it was the first time in my life, and I was 40 years old when I intersected this business, when I intersected production, I was the same way. I was like the guy who was like, there was no other option. Mm -hmm. It was just going to be the way it was. And I have been, in my opinion, very successful in what I do, and, and I've made a great living for myself, and I've got a great business. And that is because I wasn't even caring about what the payoff was. Right. I was caring about what that project and what that job was that day. Right. You know, and I lived, eat, breathed, and, and, and drank it. And I think that's what you're saying. Yeah, that's the only way to do it. Same yeah. thing with us here. And we, you know, we built this place. We knew it was going to be a long road. We didn't think we were going to get rich off right. um, this place. It was we, something we decided to do because we were passionate about it. Yeah, and you know it's it's it can be frustrating. Yeah, at times, of course, any business is. But you, if you do not have that dogged determination, like you said, it's you're really stacking the odds against yourself. Oh yeah. If, oh, if yeah. you work in a multimedia. Absolutely, absolutely, and and just to make it as an individual freelancer, you, oh, you, of course, you need that mindset. Definitely. You know what? I think we're going to go to a quick little break right now. So, uh, guys, let's take a, a quick break, and we'll be uh, right back. Hi, I'm Bernie. I own Bernie's Grip and Lighting, San Diego Grip and Lighting, and Los Angeles Grip and Lighting. You know, we pride ourselves on not only renting you the best equipment, but also giving you the best crews. And one of our core values here at Bernie's Grip and Lighting is that we give you the highest production value in the world. And remember, people used to say national, local, no. We present world-class production value on every set. We also know budgets are very tight these days, and you've got 10 hours to get what you need in the can. We move ahead, we move fast, and we know what you need. When you rent from Bernie's Grip and Lighting, you have a partner on your production for that day that is making sure you are well taken care of. So anytime you're in Southern California, give us a call at 714-609-3545 and we'll take very good care of you. See you on set. Hey everybody, back here with Mike Miller of Hybrid Studios. And Mike, we were just talking about, uh, you know how, how tough it is to make it in the business these days, in the music business, certainly, where, where a lot of money has been taken out of the system and everything like that. And you just spoke to the type of determination that you, it, it takes to become an artist or 
successful in this industry. And I, I think it, uh, great words. If you didn't get a chance, you're just tuning in, go back, listen to what Mike said, because it's, it's really, really good stuff. But with that, say the industry out there, what has happened to the big companies? Because here's the thing, and, and I'm just asking somebody, I'm just asking you this because I don't know. When somebody signs with a record company, what kind of situation is that? I, I've heard so many horror stories about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I'm not. Is, a, is there any, even any such thing anymore? There are. I mean, the, most of the big bands are still on labels um, because those labels are still down to invest in bands they know are going to get them a return. I'd say that number of bands has dwindled down. Back in like up until the late 90s, record labels were down to throw out bets on bands. They wanted to bring in bands and they'd say they they sign them up to go in the studio for 3 months at a time, record me an album and they were they were willing to take bets on bands because if one of those bands blew up, then everyone would buy their CDs, their right. physical media, they would get a payoff for all the ones that didn't work. Sure. That now that people aren't buying CDs, that model has shrunk down from their side. Yeah. Um, so the big bands, you know, will still be on a label. That label will be able to provide them, um, you know, with marketing, mm. be able to organize tours for them, connect them, put them on commercials, what have you. Um, the smaller bands, you know, there isn't as much incentive to sign with the label. Labels still exist. Labels' models are constantly shifting around. Mm. Uh, they've moved more towards trying to distribute and do things with artist music, but in general, and I don't want to hurt the feelings of any labels, any smaller labels, but usually when I talk to bands, the impression I get from them on smaller bands is they don't see the point in signing with the label. Yeah. Especially, not just because the label can't provide them anything great, but more because the tools and resources online to promote your own music and distribute your own music are so so readily available. Well, that's now. it. They're, they're almost right there at their fingertips, so yep. what are they going to do for them? Yeah, exactly. If, you can get, if you're a small band starting out, you can go to Apple Music and literally just put your music up there or go to Spotify. There are sites that shop them all to all those sites simultaneously. You can do that. You can, you can get on the phone. You can call. You can get your own shows. You can do it yourself. Yeah. Uh, unless you're someone who really feels like, you know, you have a great person who can bump you up to the next level. There's not as much incentive as there was back in the day. Yeah. Um, you know, big band, back in the day, a label would pay, like I said, would pay to put them up in the studio for several months. Even the biggest bands now, when they come through and do a record, if we get a, a, a top end band, usually they won't be in the studio more than a month. So even for the big guys, their amount of time they're and, spending has shrunk down. And do you have clients like that yeah. that will come in for a month, a, yeah. a, a big band? Sure. Can, can you say who's been in here? Are you like, um, that's yeah. not, not considered? Sure. We, we work with a lot of great uh, multi-platinum and, and Grammy-winning producers. Mm -hmm. um, so our producer list is really what I'm really proud of. Uh, but they brought through some awesome bands. We've done uh, worked with a lot of metal bands, honestly. Okay. Or been awesome. Some of bigger bands, bands like uh, Mice and Men, Trivium. Um, uh, guys from Black Crows has come in. Guys from Lamb of God have come in. Um, uh, Mike and Nez from Alice in Chains. A lot of cool, cool guys have come through and do come in all the time. We get some pretty high-level rappers, um, but it's it's always a crapshoot. Yeah. And because I, I a lot of the times I'm dealing directly with the production. Yeah. Uh, the producer and the engineer. If it's a big artist, generally I'll know ahead of time, but sometimes they'll show up and it's a big artist, which is always awesome. That's kind of cool. For me, it's more having those production people in the studio because yeah. that's that's more reoccurring work. Right. The producer will keep coming back with projects, right. whereas the band's going to record maybe once a year. Yeah. So the bands are nice. Trying When you're selling studio time to artists, they always want to know what cool bands have recorded in the studio. They like yeah. to record in a space where some of their heroes have recorded. Yeah. But for me, that's not as important as getting the, the high-end production people. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I'd say in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> good. Well, that's just like uh, so if you, people ask me, oh, what movie stars have you, you know, right. worked with or something like that. That's a natural, sure. sort of a natural thing, even for I people totally in it. the industry. Right. Is. You know, everybody likes to say they're not starstruck. And, sure. And they're probably not, but look, a name's a name. Yeah. You know, you can identify with it. Sure. We've had great clients on our, our soundstage, too, and our video clients. We work with Blizzard, Nike, and, and some really cool people that have come through organically yeah. as well. So we're really, you know, that's really cool. On the, we, in the yeah. stage, in the studio. You know, it, it, it's funny, too, because you hit upon something, and we actually discussed this a day or two, but I, it was a very learning, uh, learning uh, chance for me, a learning experience, is that 
and this makes so much sense, I don't know why I didn't think of it before, it's not the name, it's not the band, they're simply a conduit. Your relationship is with the producer yes. because they're somebody who is out there intersecting artists all the time, mm -hmm. intersecting uh, what their needs are. And if you have a good relationship with that producer, they're here in the studio and they know, I want to take them down here right. because that's where I like to get the best sound. At. Absolutely. The, the production people have always been our goal. Our yeah. aim. We love production people. You know, high-end producers, uh, music producers, they usually have their own home studio, mm -hmm. but they don't want to, if a band's coming out from like Florida or something, they don't want to have to put up the, have the band, bring the band into their house. They prefer to go somewhere like us. We provide hospitality service. Mm -hmm. We'll provide them nice clean rooms and great equipment and they can show up here and work out of our space. Yeah. It keeps it uh, nice and clean on our end because we're not getting into, you know, offering services. Um, we sell time. Across you the board. Sell time. So just hourly time, and you can tell a high-level production person, you know, this is your time to do whatever you want. You want to go in there and take a nap? You want to go in there and throw a party? <laughs> be, be my it's guest. Fine with me. Yeah. You know, and so it really helps us with the back end. It helps us bring in multiple people all the time. Yeah. Because we're not worrying about okay, we need more time to finish this guy's song. Yeah. Or this person's not happy with this song or that. Yeah. We don't worry about that stuff because we don't offer services. Yeah. Um, we sell hourly time, and as long as our equipment works and our people are nice and the rooms look great, then people will always walk away happy. That's awesome. That's a great model. That's a really great model. Um, and how long have you been here now? What, what is that? When did you open your doors? We're coming up on five years here. Okay. Um, I think the build out took a year or so. So yeah. Hybrid Studios has technically existed about six years, but okay. coming up on five years of operation. Of operation, that's great. And what do you feel like it took you to get a foothold? Because let, let's face it, we and this is pro probably a lot of people don't understand this is that we're, we're in Orange County, and Los Angeles is about thirty five miles to the north, but. In some cases, it may as well be a thousand miles for the, the people who want to leave LA and then come here. Sure. So, so how long was that startup for you, and what is that LA sort of Orange County relationship like for you when yeah. somebody has to drive on the freeway? So the LA OC thing is kind of funny because uh, we thought when we opened that we would corner Orange County business, basically stop people from going from Orange County up to LA. Yeah. And we find that a lot of people like to come down from LA to Orange County because yeah. we're able to offer bigger rooms, more space, you can park, uh, you could spread out. Right. It's nice, it's, people like that. They appreciate yeah. the somewhat slower pace. At the same time, we, we tend to think we offer an LA style business model. Right. It's more studios up in LA offer the hourly time model yeah. as opposed to the production services. Orange County studios, a lot of them tend to be uh, production houses where you go to the studio to work with the operator of that studio. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting dynamic. It's it's there was a bit of a learning curve. Yeah. People would hit us up expecting more of the Orange County model, and we'd have to explain to them our model. Yeah. Um, so to answer your well, it's a long way winded way of saying yeah, yeah, yeah. it took some time. Yeah. Um, it's such a word of mouth business. The number one thing we can control is people leaving happy from the yeah. studio, and then they tend to tell someone else. And so. I do tours all the time of this facility, and the thing I hear every day is, I didn't know this place was here. I never knew this place was yeah. here. And I was some that's, that's studios. Yeah. You tend not to know a studio exists until you know it exists, until you need a reason for a studio. Until you need it. And so we have a great uh, roster of, of great high-level people now that keep coming back, um, especially in our music side. Now that we have great production people, our music side just perpetually keeps growing, and we get busier and busier. Yeah. Same with the soundstage. Although our soundstage is a little more specific, so we, we have great great roster of clients over there as well. But they really would need somewhere that, you know, for their shoot their shoot would need to demand a white cyclorama. Right. So just just them having another shoot is not reason enough for them to come here. So that side tends to grow a little slower. Yeah. But um, it's all mostly organic. We've we've done some marketing things like that, but nothing in this industry it beats word of mouth in my experience. Oh no no it's it's. It's still such a small industry when you get right down to it. When you, it's big and it's got a huge presence and all that. Mm -hmm. But when you, when you get down to it, it's all word of mouth sure. because it's a small group of people, believe it or not. And I mean, yes, they're in the the tens of thousands, yeah. agreed. But it's really a small group of people in the world that make media. Definitely, you know. 
And uh, as far as your stage goes, you know, I, I as you know, I was at, at, at uh, um, Dot Lot stages mm -hmm. down South Orange County for about three years. That's where we were before we came here to sure. uh, um, uh, our facility hybrid. And um, there's two things going on with a soundstage. And this is, this is why, you know, you've seen the difference. You know, mm -hmm. people adopt your audio, audio works much quicker than they do the soundstage. Is that first there's the 30 mile zone. Sure. And that is like a brick wall. We're actually just inside of that. Are you really? We are. Are you really? So I think Patrick, the stage owner, actually had that in mind when he built the stage. Yeah, that's good. But uh, yeah, that's that has gotten us a couple but, shoots, but it's still yeah. so far out there it's on that zone. It's still so far out of the zone. That it, you I don't know think what? most people know that. Well, yeah. And my, my good friend Roland Cannemeyer, who's a Silver Dream Factory, I don't know if you're familiar with them or mm -hmm. something, he's right by the Orange County line. He does get it. Now, he... He sort of focuses and specializes in lower budget stuff, you know, and he has standing sets. Mm -hmm. So that is really his calling card. He does a pretty good business. But people from Los Angeles are not going to come down here to shoot. No. But they will come down, as you say, to record. Yeah. The only time people really come down from L.A. to shoot here is if the client is here, especially yeah. like a high-end client who yeah. doesn't want to drive to L.A., yeah. That's that's gotten us some work from time. Have to you time. had Snoop in here before? Not or? Snoop, no. Oh, okay. But we've had like uh, we when we did some stuff with Nike. They had some athletes here, yeah, um, who didn't want to drive to L.A., so they ended up coming down here. So that does happen from time to time. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. Yeah, it's it's yeah. it's a little it's bit a, more out it's of the a much t tougher thing when you're next door to the production colossus. Yeah. you know what I mean. Sure. But at the same time, and I think this is true for you. There is a way to manage that to make money. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And that is you're sort of the the go-to person in your market sure. who is right there for whenever you need it. And you have a more, I think, uh, compared to L.A., like <clears throat> in L.A. you may have, if you had this one studio, it could get booked up for, say, two or three months, which would be fantastic for you except for all the business you had to turn away right. during that time. Right. Right? No, you know? you're right? And then you're not nurturing new clients. The, I have sort of flipped the thing when I'm not going to go on long shows here. I know my shows are going to be one, two, or three days probably mm -hmm. for the better part. And um, uh, what I've done is used that. You know, I can get all my cheap equipment from L.A. if I need to do sub rentals and, and make a run back and forth. But I have so many more clients down here that is just, I mean, it's crazy. Right. You know, I, I could never get that amount in L.A. because I would have been too tied up with individual clients at one given time. Right. It's, it's never bad to be, you know, a big fish in a small pond, so to speak. No, no, it's not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But we're going to go to another little uh, commercial right here. We'll, we'll be right back. Bernie's Workshop is fantastic. Bernie's Workshop is awesome. Bernie's Workshop is insightful. Bernie, in one word, passionate maybe. You can tell he really cares a lot. Bernie is a badass. <laughs> He's a great teacher. He has great stories. And I would recommend this to anyone. Not only someone like me who's starting day one, but you know, I feel that in any profession, as you sharpen your sword, it always gets sharper. I think the one, the best thing about this is, is the access to understanding how to run your business, how to actually be in this filmmaking industry and make money at it. Coming to this workshop, I think, is what actually gets you the tools to understand how to do that, how to get out there and, and sell yourself. I thought that was really cool. I thought, um, he, I mean, he knows all the tricks in the book and uh, he knows how to show that to us and actually demonstrate it so we actually know what he's talking about. I really like the, the hands-on experience. That's, that's something that you don't find a lot. That's something you have to go on, on set a lot to, uh, to just appreciate. I know we, this is a lighting seminar, but it's not only talk about lighting. He also share his business experience, personal experience, and tell us, guide us to what we should do, what kind of personality we should have in this business. His stories, I think that they kind of Say, say everything all in a few example stories that he gives out from time to time. I would recommend this workshop to anybody who's just brand new to the industry, people who just don't know the swing of it. Um, a lot of the stuff they don't teach you in film school. I deal with a lot of freelancers every day, a lot of peers that I went to school with, a lot of professionals in the field, and they all need to take this class because it just, it just it puts you on the next level, on the next playing field. Bernie's a great guy. Bernie's really authentic. Like everything he learns, everything he teaches, the way he handles himself, the way he deals with other people, he's a one-of-a-kind guy. Someone I've never come across before in the industry and someone I hope to 
emulate and hope that there are more people like him out there that can help. Hey everybody, welcome back. We're here with Mike Miller of Hybrid Studios and we're just talking about that business model, the, the recording business model, how it's changed over the years. I know uh, there's so many analogies too between the video and, and, and like I said, there's that word again, video, but the digital media world of producing content and music. And it's, it's uh, just to, to summarize here, talking about too how married the two are. I mean, you don't see a, music, a movie without music. Every little piece usually contains some music, yet our worlds don't intersect very often. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's funny. Music, pe audio people are always looking for video people. Yeah. Uh, it's so funny. And yeah, it goes both ways. They are very much two worlds. Most of the people here at the studio are from more of a music background, mm -hmm. myself included. Um, and it, it's, I've been picking up the video stuff slowly over the mm -hmm. past five years to the mm -hmm. point where I'm a little bit confident to talk yeah. about it, yeah. but it's still not my world. They're, yeah. um, they are apart, but they are so combined. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting. Well, you know what, that, that brings us to, first, tell me a little bit about your background and then tell me about how hybrid came to be. What, what, what started that impetus? Sure, so um, if you don't mind, I'll do it in reverse. Okay, that. so very good. That'll make more sense for how I got involved, but the. Uh, the studio was started by two of my good friends, uh, Patrick Accomplish and Billy Klein, and they've actually been friends since they were babies. Their mothers were best friends, and they're oh, the same awesome. age, so they've literally grown up together. Uh, Patrick uh, has always had an eye for, for multimedia for video mm -hmm. um, and had a video production company and was, was doing that for a while. At the same time, Billy got his engineering degree, audio engineering degree, and worked at some pretty high-level L.A. studios. They both got to get, they both hit, I guess, what you call a glass ceiling. At yeah. their respective sure. um, crafts, and they got together and said, "You know what? Why don't we open up a multimedia production facility in Orange County?" Billy was in Hollywood at the time, working in a studio, and he always kind of wanted to go back down to Orange County. So he brought his LA recording studio knowledge and brought it down here. And Pat uh, brought his video production knowledge, and they put it together to create the space of a hybrid of both audio and video. That is so um, awesome. So that that's how this place kind of started, and why it's kind of unique, and why we have both sides. Um, myself, I've been, like I said, good friends with them forever. I was roommates with Billy for years and years, and he always had a home recording studio. Uh, I was in bands with him since high school. He really got an eye or an ear for audio engineering very young, and so he was always recording our bands, and even in high school, he knew very early on he wanted to do that. So I was lucky enough to be his guinea pig and to be in a lot of his studios, you know, from home studios to uh, the studio at LMU where he got his audio engineering degree to the professional studios that he worked in in Hollywood, uh, which gave me a lot of you know, good insider knowledge on how recorders, recording studios work. Mm -hmm. um, as, at the time they were building this place and it took a year to build out or so, I was working doing administrative management down uh, for UCSD. Okay. Um, and I've worked a number of administrative management jobs, but when this position opened, it was really you know, a no-brainer for me yeah. to, to go back into what I love to do, which is music. Um, and multimedia, and I could use my administrative management skills to throw it all together. So um, the three of us have really been putting this thing together now for five years uh, with Pat's video knowledge, Billy's music knowledge, and my administrative management knowledge. We've really come together to make a good trifecta, I would say. Well, that's um, awesome. But yeah, it's a, you know, I've always been a musician, um, so being around music, being in studios has always been something I love. It's, it's definitely not for everybody. Yeah. But I, I love it. Eat it yeah. up. I am so uninclined, I guess, to music. I mean, I, I if somebody goes, oh, he's singing off key. I, I could not tell you he's singing <laughs> off key. I have no idea. You know what I mean? So it's always been a mystery to me, and I know I don't have the ear for it. You know what I mean? And now the ears weren't even as good as they were when <laughs> I started. So obviously it's a... Tell me, what instruments do you play? What what? Uh... I started on guitar and vocals. I've been writing music since I was a kid. Uh, I came from a pretty musical family. Um, everyone in my family plays music. I just I never could pick up piano, but I really gravitated towards guitar. Some guitar since I was a kid um, and singing. Uh, once I started here, in a different bands, I really gravitated towards bass guitar. So most of the studio work that I do, if someone asks me to come in and participate, it's normally bass guitar, okay. which I love. Bass guitar, you know, it's it's great. I love the the low end of the mm -hmm. song, mm -hmm. and it's it's generally easier. Sorry if I'm offending any basses, 
but mm. that's nice for me. Yeah. There's a lot more stress when you're playing guitar, I feel like. Yeah. There's a lot more tones and well, things like and that. Well, and everybody, you're, you're kind of leading, I, yes. I mean, right? It's yeah. more of a focus. Yeah. Uh, even when you're playing live music, if you're playing bass and you mess up, no one tends to notice. Yeah. Ex unless you're a bass player. Yeah. Um, so it's a very freeing. It's, it's great. So yeah. I, well, I started on guitar and I didn't play bass until maybe four or five years ago. That's really where I've gravitated to now that I'm in the studio all the time. Um, so, but yeah, I, I can play a little bit of everything. Yeah. But guitars and vocals, uh, writing lyrics and things like that's that have your, always been my strong that's point. That's your strong suit. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know what? I, I just thought of a question. It's probably a real doozy. So, you know, I mean, if we can't answer it, we can't answer it. But, and it probably isn't a short answer. But, you know, um, as far as genres go of music, okay, rock and roll. Obviously, you, you look at me, you look at my age, you know that was the king when I was growing up. Now, I feel, and this is more just on, on a generalization of what most people, you know, maybe not like, but, but what's out there, what's big in the market, is country. What happened to rock and roll? How did rock and roll, did, when did it die? And, and, <laughs> and uh, when, did, when was the birth of country western? Yeah, that, so is, that is a tough question. Um, I'll tell you... Um, the Nashville music scene yeah. has really been going strong. It never really declined, yeah. uh, whereas a bunch of the you know other genres somewhat have. Nashville is a very strong music hub today, and always has been a very strong studio hub. Um, you know, the South in general is is loves country. Yeah. People love country. All I mean, I place. like country. Yeah, country's yeah. great, but the it's really remained strong. Like you said, I'm a, I'm from rock too. I love rock. Yeah. Um, it's it's still there. It just maybe doesn't get as much love, and you know, music goes ebbs and flows. Yeah. Genres ebb and flow. Yeah. It's it's it'll always be there. You know, it's when I think about genres, um, it's really weird because I talked to you a little about the metal bands that come in here. You would think that metal isn't big anymore; that it had its run in the late '80s or the '90s. It's still huge, you know. And we get these bands in here that are are big metal bands, and they have hardcore followings of young people. Mm -hmm. um, which I was kind of honestly surprised at. Yeah. You, um, young high school girls who love metal, things like that. So the genres still go strong. All the genres are, are still there. It's like, it's more been divided up and yeah. maybe it's not as front and center. Right. How we talked about how uh, record labels and things like that, they're more selective mm -hmm. on what they're promoting and stuff like that. So th I think a lot of them, they double down, they really promote the pop and the things that they know are going to sell and that they can sell for commercials easily, and things like that. Easily, what they can sell easily. So yeah. it's th that stuff's always front and center now because music has become so focused. But those genres are still out there and mm -hmm. they're still doing fine at the highest levels. Interesting, interesting. You know, I worked with the Stones a couple times and I, I went to one of their uh, opening shows in Los Angeles when they did the last uh, Zip Code tour, I think it was, with the, through the U.S. and uh, did that and when we were at their their opening show, which we were we were doing some taping there, we uh, I noticed the line out front because it was a giveaway show, so mm -hmm. you won tickets through the radio station or whatever, and I was really surprised, maybe not surprised, but you know it wasn't the young crowd, mm -hmm. right? You know, I mean it was it was a group, and you could tell that this is there's such smart. I think Mick Jagger sure. is one of the the music industry geniuses, you, you know, of, of somebody who's a really top business person, which he doesn't get credit for, mm -hmm. you know, as far as he figured out exactly how to keep that band going and every size stadium they needed to Absolutely. fill. And they're still doing it. They're just going on another European tour. Yeah, th those guys are incredible. Yeah. But yeah, the, I mean, getting back to what we were talking about work ethic, those guys don't stop. They still haven't stopped. They do not stop. Yeah. And working with them one another, because I was at one of their rehearsals for a day, you know, uh, we, we did that, and they were just, I mean, as into it as any young band or, mm -hmm. or, or could be. Um, listen, we're out of time, buddy. So, uh, Mike, thank you so much. Tell me, uh, how do people get a hold of Hybrid Studios? Sure, you can check us out at www.hybridstudiosca.com. Uh, we're also available at social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all at Hybrid Studios CA. Uh, you can give us a call, 714-850-1499 if you want to speak to me directly. Um, but yeah, we're everywhere. All Hybrid Studios CA.
Thanks so much for having right. me, man. This oh, been awesome. I are you kidding? It. Thanks, and, and thanks for having us because now Hybrid Studios is the new home of Apple Box Network. So uh, we're all here, and we appreciate it, buddy. I love it. It's great all having right. you guys. Great. And we'll see you guys next week, 2 o'clock Fridays, all right, on the Apple Box Network. Cut. That's a wrap.